So, good afternoon. My name is Samantha Sanangurai. I'm with Lena Cheshe in Southern Africa where I am the regional representative. And um, we're just waiting. Okay, I think everybody's settling. Our topic is improving the response of the criminal justice system to people with disabilities. And today I'm flanked by my colleagues, Andrew McKenzie, Ariel Sims, uh, Peter McCabe, and Carlos Rios Espinosa. And they work for International Bar Association, the National Center for Criminal Justice and Disability, Headway, the Brain Injury Association, and Human Rights Watch, respectively. I, I do not come here today having, um, I mean, doing some work already in, in this area with Lena Cheshire, but I do have interest in the work because I've, I've previously worked with children um, with disabilities who are accessing the justice system in Zimbabwe. And I've also recently done some, some work around that. But coming to this conference, some critical questions that I had were around you know, responding to the needs of persons with disabilities accessing the justice system in a context where our justice systems are normally characterized by institutionalized corruption, predatory law enforcers, prosecutors, magistrates, <clears throat> high incidences of arrest of poor people, arbitrary arrests and detention, under-resourced systems, you know, in terms of finances, the human resources, infrastructure, equipment, poor legal frameworks, and very politicized justice systems, as well as services that are very expensive, normally in terms of the lawyers. Um, but also services that are not um, there in terms of the social um, services. Um, and also looking at persons with disability as a group of people that are normally absent or invisible in the system. Um, so the system does not really understand their needs. Um, and they, they are lumped up as one group. Um, so if, if um, a court, for example, a court building puts up a ramp, then they think, yay, we're very, very accessible now. Everybody can come. But the needs of persons with disabilities are very diverse. And I think one of the most critical things for me is also knowing that the needs of women with disabilities are very important and often overlooked. And the other aspect is understanding that when persons with disability it is come in contact with the justice system, they come in contact as victims and also as perpetrators. And normally for society it's okay when they're victims, um, but when they're perpetrators, then the reaction is very, it's very bad. It's like, oh, you, you've got a disability and now you're perpetrating? What's wrong with you, you know? But they just, they are human beings and they experience life in the same way as everybody else. So when they do come in contact with the justice system as perpetrators, we need to ensure that their rights are protected. We need to make sure that we, we do not curse them for, for going against the grain um, that we've set as, as a society. And therefore it's, and, and also more so for, for women with disabilities who come in contact with the justice system. They're often denied certain services, um, like access to their reproductive health rights, things like their sanitary <coughs> wear. And therefore it's very important when we're thinking about the response systems to have these things clearly set out in our minds. And I think my colleagues will share a lot this afternoon um, about how we can respond in a, in a, in a strategic way, in a, in a way that's relevant to our different contexts. And they will have a lot to share in terms of lessons that they have learned. And I'm hoping that um, you each go home with something today. So to start off our presentations, 
Um, I will leave this time to Andrew McKenzie from the International Bar Association. Andrew. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, I'm Andrew McKenzie. I'm Chief Executive of the Scottish Arbitration Centre, uh, but I'm here today representing the International Bar Association. The IBA is the foremost organisation for international legal practitioners with a membership of 80,000 lawyers involving 190 bar associations and law societies spanning 170 countries. It has various committees and projects, and I'm the co-chair of the IBA Access to Justice Committee. We worked with the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law on an international study into access to justice for persons with disabilities. Focused on legal framework and barriers to access to justice and published a report on our findings in October 2017. That report will be the focus of my short presentation today. Oh. Yeah. The report's uh, purpose was to identify barriers to access to justice for persons with disabilities. So the report looks at examples from various uh, jurisdictions around the world, as well as solutions to overcome them, and shares good practice. The goal was to raise awareness of uh, the barriers and ways to address them, provide a tool for lawyers, and also to prompt further discussion and research. The international legal framework includes the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which has been ratified by 174 states. It notes, crucially, that states must ensure effective access to justice for persons with disabilities on an equal basis with others. The UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goals are also part of that legal framework, as is domestic law and policy. The overarching arching barriers to access to justice are varied, societal barriers and, of course, legal barriers, including discriminatory laws and or lack of adequate laws and access to information, legal information, that is. There's also financial barriers and accessibility barriers. Barriers to access to justice in legal proceedings cover criminal, civil and administrative matters. In respect of criminal proceedings, this might include pre-trial matters, issues for victims and witnesses, legal responsibility, and of course, detention issues. In civil proceedings, the report focuses on challenging legal capacity decisions, and administrative proceedings are also covered in the report. There are various examples of barriers to access to justice in the report, but it also it looks at initiatives in some jurisdictions aimed at enhancing access to justice for persons with disabilities. One example comes from my own country, that's Scotland, which I should note has a separate legal and justice system to our neighbours in England and Wales. So I'm going to focus on that example here and provide an update on the initiative set out in the report. But there are many other examples uh, in the report from different countries, and I hope that you'll have the chance to have a look at those also. The Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service states that jurors play a pivotal role in Scotland's criminal justice system. In recognition of the role that jurors who present with hearing and sight impairments can provide, it is now exploring what reasonable adjustments and measures might be put in place in courts to support jurors. And also at the criteria that may be considered by the court in determining the suitability of a person to serve as a juror in a particular case. Those reasonable adjustments consist of the following. The appointment of jury liaison officers who will be receiving in-house training devised in consultation with RNIB and Deaf Scotland. 
Also, the purchase of portable, easy-to-use hearing units and magnifiers to aid those with sight and hearing impairment for use in the courtroom and also in the jury deliberation room. There will also be a short one-page leaflet to be published on the court's website in various formats to encourage early engagement by the potential juror. It is envisaged that these measures will be implemented during the course of this year and will allow those jurors to discharge this important civil duty in modern day Scotland. So this is one example of how a, a jurisdiction is trying to ensure full involvement in the justice system for persons with disabilities. As I said, there are other examples of good practice in the report looking at a variety of different countries. So what about the findings? Amongst the main findings of the report were that crime against people with disabilities appears to be significantly underreported. It was also found that litigation can effectively help overturn discriminatory laws by intervening at an early stage, but can only have a wider impact on discriminatory laws and practices where these can be evidenced. That requires data. Yet data gathered by many countries does still not include a breakdown in relation to people with disabilities. The report also found that in many countries where people with mental disabilities are deemed unfit to stand trial, they are still deprived of their liberty through enforced hospitalization, and this is often in conflict with human rights law. The treatment of and communication with people with disabilities during judicial proceedings are usually under voluntary guidelines with these applied at best in an ad hoc fashion. Also importantly, it was found that new technologies and the development of online dispute resolution can help people with disabilities overcome marginalization in the justice system. Governments and the legal com community should be open to the benefits that these technologies provide, and we've heard lots this week about how technology is assisting people with disabilities. On recommendations of the report, so better uh, reporting of crimes against people with disabilities, uh, more data on discrimination in relation to such people is needed. There's a need also to ensure that laws that may have a negative impact against such people do not enter the statute book at all. And also lawyers involved in advocacy should challenge such laws. Further research and investigation is needed in order to resolve the conflicts between denial or restriction of legal capacity and human rights. Voluntary guidelines on treatment of and communication with people with disabilities during judicial proceeding needs to be strengthened into codes of practice to ensure consistency and structure and to make them binding and there should be more support for online dispute resolution platforms. It is clear that more needs to be done to break down some of the additional barriers to access to justice often faced by those with disabilities, and we hope that the IBA report will raise awareness of these issues. Clearly, being invited by the Zero Project to speak to the report at this prestigious conference assists with that goal and provides the legal profession with a key role in discussions in respect of access to justice in this area. Ultimately, we hope our work will lead to enhanced access to justice for some of the more vulnerable in society. So what are the next steps? Well, further distribution of the report, and that's something you can help with by reading the report and, and sharing it individually or in your organizations, raises awareness of some of the findings within this work. Further research and aspects of the report. And again, if any of you, either individually or your, your associations, uh, are interested in being part of further research, there's a lot more work required. Finally, guidelines for courts and tribunals is what we plan to do next. And again, we'd be keen to collaborate with any of you on that work. So here is my email address, but also a link to the report. It's on the International Bar Association website. It's on the page 
for the IBA Access to Justice and Legal Aid Committee. Please do have a look at the report and please do share it as widely as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew, um, for a very good presentation. He mentions, um, among other recommendations, better reporting of crimes, more data on persons with disability, um, and more support for online dispute resolution. That's something very new for me, and further research to resolve conflicts. Next, we have Ariel Sims. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for being here. I realize it is the last parallel session of the day of the conference and on a Friday. So I want to just say thank you on behalf of myself and the other panelists for, for sticking around for this. We really appreciate it. My name is Ariel Sims. I am the Senior Program Manager and Attorney for Criminal Justice Initiatives at the ARC of the United States. And for the next 10 minutes, hopefully nine, I want you to use this space however you would like to. This is your space to, to learn, to hear, to engage with us. So if you need to get up and walk around, if you need to stretch, if you need to check your email, please feel free to do any of those things. I want you to feel very comfortable in the space. The ARC of the United States is the largest and oldest disability rights organization that advocates for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the United States. And it started in 1950, and today it has grown to include over 600 chapters located across the United States. In 2013, the ARC received a grant from the US government, and the government said, we really need to create some kind of bridge between the criminal justice community on the one hand and the disability community on the other. Because as we know, these two communities don't often understand each other, and they often don't get along, and sometimes they don't even use the same language to communicate. And as a result, we know that people with disabilities are more likely to be represented as victims of crimes, but also as suspects, defendants, and incarcerated people. So we created the ARC's National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability to answer this mandate from the federal government. And we do this in a few different ways. So we provide training and technical assistance to criminal justice professionals. So if you're a police officer, a defense attorney, a judge, a victim advocate, and you're working with somebody with a developmental disability and you're just not quite sure what to do, you can reach out to our organization for assistance. We also provide information and referral services to people with disabilities directly and their families and supporters so that when they get into the worst situation of their life, either because they've experienced victimization or they're being charged with a crime, they have a place that they can turn to. We also create resources for the field at that intersection of criminal justice and disability. And when we discover that there isn't a resource that should be out there, we try to create it ourselves. And then we generally raise awareness about these issues in the disability world, in the justice world, and for the general public, because most people don't realize this is even an issue in the first place. But what I really want to talk to you about is Pathways to Justice, which is one of the project awardees this year, and we're so excited about that. And thank you again to the Essel Foundation for that. We really appreciate your support. Now, on the screen in front of you, there are three large orange arrows, and they're divided up into steps, and I'm going to go through each one. And then at the bottom of this slide, there is a photo of a group of people all standing together, and this is one of our disability response teams. So Pathways to Justice, at its heart, at its essence, is a way to increase access to justice for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we do this through a three-step process. 
in step one, we facilitate the creation of a disability response team, which brings together criminal justice stakeholders and disability stakeholders, and we get them around the same table talking to each other about what is going on in their community and what are the barriers to justice for people with disabilities. Once that disability response team is created in step two, we partner with the disability response team to deliver an all-day training for law enforcement, for legal professionals, and for victim advocates. And we teach these professionals how to more effectively recognize disability, how to more effectively communicate with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and how, most importantly, to more appropriately serve, interact, and support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities as they move through the criminal justice process. And again, it doesn't matter if they are a victim or they are a suspect, a defendant, incarcerated person, Pathways is for them all. In step three, we provide ongoing technical assistance to the disability response teams to ensure that they feel empowered and they have the energy to keep going. This is really difficult work to do, and they're often doing it above and beyond their regular jobs. So we want to be there as a source of support and guidance for them. Pathways is community-based, it's multidisciplinary, and it's all about relationships. But most importantly, we want to adhere to the mantra of the human rights world when it comes to disability, and that is nothing about us without us. So people with disabilities are an integral part of the disability response team, and they are lead trainers alongside others when we teach criminal justice professionals about these issues. To date, we've created 15 disability response teams in 12 states across the United States. And there is a map behind me on the slides, and the slides are, excuse me, the states in orange are where we have created at least one disability response team. There's also an image of a young man with developmental disability smiling because we also know at the end of the day, it's about people with disabilities. And we've trained over 1,200 justice professionals since 2015 and reached over 5,000 stakeholders. Right now, Pathways to Justice is funded primarily through federal grants, even though we're exploring licensing and the use of a train-the-trainer model. And we still have some challenges. It's hard to get funding in this area. As Sam, our moderator, was saying earlier, sometimes people want to put money into to victims' issues, but they don't want to necessarily talk about the other side of the system. People are being charged with crimes. We also don't have any research and evaluation expertise in-house, and we all know that funders like to see impact. So we're constantly thinking of new ways that we can measure our impact and what we're doing with Pathways to Justice. And I think one of our biggest challenges are local partners. We ask a lot of our local partners. It's a very intensive process to get involved in this team to help us organize and set up these trainings and participate and to keep things going after we have left the community. But we so rely on our local partners and we just thank them immensely for their efforts. So as far as next steps for Pathways to Justice, in 2019, we're looking to go to 10 additional sites all across the United States. And we're going to be doing that through a couple of different projects. One is called the Serving Safely Initiative, which is also funded by the United States government. And it creates a national training and technical assistance center for law enforcement and prosecutors specifically. The other initiative, which is very exciting, uh, we're partnering with an organization called Grow Through Opportunity, which does internships for youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities with first responder agencies. So we're going to combine our two initiatives and see what we can accomplish together and see if what we're doing when we combine these interventions, if we're having an even larger impact. And we're going to continue refining our train the trainer version of Pathways to Justice, extending our capacity to do this work. So I just wanted to show you a picture of our team. We are small but mighty. We are also extremely good looking, so enjoy. 
enjoy that. <laughs> and uh, please, we look forward to working with you. Please reach out to us. We can't wait to tell you more about Pathways to Justice. I'm also here with my colleague, Leanne Davis, who's here in the front. Wave, Leanne. So please come up to us afterwards if you have questions. We also have some lovely brochures courtesy of our marketing department to share with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ariel. I really liked your presentation, um, particularly that you're catering for all groups of persons with disability in, um, who are in contact with the justice system. I also liked that the work is community-based because I think that's a first step in ensuring that the justice system is demystified. Most people get to know about the institutions when they get in contact with the system. Um, next up, we will have Peter McCabe. Is that right? Correct. Good. Um, sorry. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, I'm here to talk about the justice project that Headway, um, my organisation, uh, launched a couple of years ago. And uh, our job is to support survivors of a brain injury, uh, and we've grown from being a small self-help organisation 40 years ago to today a, a UK-wide organisation with a network of 125 uh, local affiliates. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to rattle through the, the presentation uh, very quickly. One of the things that I could spend a, a couple of days on is the effects of brain injury, um, but they are, uh, brain injury affects people in a variety of different ways, uh, physically, emotionally, behaviourally and cognitively. And some of these effects make it more likely that a survivor of a brain injury may come into contact with the criminal justice system. For example, a survivor uh, with, left with slurred speech or an unsteady walking gait is frequently uh, assumed to be drunk. Um, people with memory problems often genuinely forget to purchase a ticket when they get on a train uh, or a bus uh, or forget to pay for goods when they're in a shop. And that can lead them into real difficulties. And the reason uh, that we launched this project was because there's um, a huge amount of uh, evidence from right around the world that demonstrates a high prevalence of offenders with brain injuries within the criminal justice system. And the research um, is on that link there if, you, if you'd like to check it out. One of the things you'll find is that consistently the figure of over 60% uh, arises. And in addition to that uh, published research, we also had the anecdotal evidence of people um, that we deal with on a daily basis suffering injustice uh, and coming across discrimination in their everyday lives. So, for example, um, that person with the slurred speech might hail a taxi and the taxi driver refuses to carry them because they say they're drunk. That's appalling, but that happens um, to survivors uh, in this day and age. I'd like to now play um, a video which illustrates the point I've just made. With no sound? Could we try it with sound? That would be good. Firstly, going out drinking quite. Never any problem, just having a good time and everything was fine. Then when I was 21, I went to Cyprus on a work placement from university. I fell off a moped without a helmet on, so I've fallen on the floor, put me in a coma for over three months. Doctors saying I'd never walk or talk again. A lot of them saying they're not talking, but it might have been quite good. But And so from then, I was flown back to England. I had a year or so of rehab, got back to going out with my friends again and thinking, well, everything's fine. I'm, and I wasn't drinking half as much as I do because I wasn't able. 
but that's when our problem started. Aaron, which had drunk, it was it seemed to be a problem to a lot of people. Well, I've basically been arrested three times. Each time, it was a kind of I was a another drunk throwing me to the floor, handcuffing me into the Mariahs, into the police station. No real interview or anything. Just give me a name, put me in a cell, shut the door. There you go. Yeah, it was really horrible because I've never done anything wrong in my life, and to be treated like a common criminal, maybe just thrown into the cells and in the cold and freezing cold cells and dirty and smelly, and just made me feel really bad and really, what really what was my brain injury caused? Is if this is going to be the, what's going to happen to me every time I go out and drink? That's why I have stopped drinking because it's just not worth it. So, the objectives of the... Sorry, can we have the next slide, please? The objectives of the Justice Project are to raise awareness of brain injury throughout the criminal justice system, to help police, prosecutors and others working in the system to identify if they come into contact with somebody with a brain injury, to ensure that those survivors receive appropriate support, and to provide survivors with specialist legal advice and representation, and most importantly, to divert people with brain injuries away from the criminal justice system where it's appropriate. How did we do that? Well, we've introduced the brain injury identity card, and what you'll see there is it has a photo of the individual. There is a, a series of panels which enable them to identify how their injury has affected them, and that's personalised. It has the support of our National Police Chiefs Council and Police Scotland, for our friends from Scotland, uh, and um, the Police Service of Northern Ireland, and the Police Federation, which is the trade union of police officers representing rank and file officers. And that's really important. Uh, and finally, it's got a free phone number which will enable a survivor uh, that gets into the situation you've just seen with Dominic uh, to ring uh, and arrange legal representation free of charge 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The evaluation of this project has been absolutely fantastic. In fact, it was so good it started to look like a sort of Soviet-style election. When you see 97% 90, uh, of people uh, approving something, you kind of think, is this for real? But it is. And um, what they've told us is that it's, it's, it's something that they use, uh, they value, they appreciate. Uh, and Interestingly, 72% of uh, card holders have used their cards in a social setting. Um, so that could be in a shop, a bank, um, uh, or with the taxi driver that refuses to take them. We have partnered up with some really important organisations. I've mentioned the police, the prosecutors, um, and the appropriate adult network and NHS England, which provides nurses working in police stations uh, and in courts. Looking to the finance, we, like others, found it difficult uh, to fund this type of project, but we think it's really important, so we put our own resources into it, and that's the true demonstration of how important we think it is. We've had to recruit additional staff to cope with the demand. We've now issued 5,000 cards. And what we know is that the, the project is making a huge difference to survivors of a brain injury. Professionals working in the criminal justice system have welcomed this initiative. They recognize how important it is for them to have this understanding. And we are training uh, police officers, prosecutors, and all the people that you would expect and in the last week, we've actually had representations from our Ministry of Justice asking us if we'll go and work in prisons to ensure that prison staff are aware of brain injury and its effects. And we're going to continue to raise awareness of the project, uh, to provide appropriate support, and as far as we can, divert survivors away from the criminal justice system. 
I've run out of time, but I'd be happy to answer your questions. And if anyone's interested in replicating um, this project in, in your country, we'd be happy to help. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Very brilliant project there, and I can see how it will be easy to replicate it in other countries. It just reminded me of a time in Zimbabwe when one of our most celebrated TV presenters was arrested because he'd forgotten to pay at the, at the till. And, you know, everybody wondered why. But I see now if he had such a card, the arrest would have been avoided. Um, next up, we have Carlos. Thank you very much, Samantha. Thank you to the panel. Thank you for, to the Zero Project for uh, letting me present today what I'm going to say. And thank you all for, for listening. Well, my name is Carlos Rios Espinosa. I come from Mexico. And um, I've been engaged in criminal reform in Mexico for uh, some years now. Uh, I think this doesn't work. Oh, I need to put it there. Um, uh, this is a project that I was involved in before joining Human Rights Watch. Now I'm a senior researcher at Human Rights Watch. But this started uh, many years and many years ago, 2004 or so. Uh, and it has to do with uh, criminal procedure reform in Mexico that um, we've had um, since 2008 a new criminal procedure, you know, because the one we had previously was a very old and outdated uh, uh, system in which everything was done in writing. Proceedings were just um, not really handed over by a judge, no, but by paralegals no, or auxiliaries to justice that received everything, no, and then the judge simply just reviewed a written dossier and then decided on the fate of people based on what was written in the dossier. So in 2008, we had a, a reform, a constitutional reform, that established the need to have hearings, the need to have procedural safeguards for everyone, for all defendants, and the possibility of having public hearings, no? uh, in order to evaluate evidence against defendants. So uh, what does that has to do with uh, disability rights? Well, in this same package of reform, um, we uh, were able, as I, I as a part of a, of a network of uh, civil society organizations that were involved in the reform, that's called the Network for Oral Trials, to include some elements no, uh, about disability rights. Specifically, as you know, Mexico is a federation, so we have 32 states, and everyone had a different criminal procedure. No? Uh, but all of them were uh, really the same uh, as regards to uh, people with disabilities. No? When you are a defendant and you have a disability and uh, the judge considers that you're not able to face a criminal procedure, no, then they, they, they label you or they declare that you are unimputable. That's a strange word, uh, an English strange uh, it's, it's It has no translation. But it has the effect, uh, or the same effect, or, or it is very near as being declared unable to stand trial. No? So if you're considered unfit to stand trial because you have a disability, then and what the judge did was just create a special procedure. That's what, that was the, the, the main thing that, that happened. They opened a special procedure and they determined what kind of uh, security measure they're going, they were going to apply to you. So uh, this is the narrative that considers that, well, people with disabilities cannot be punished, no, because, um, well, they cannot understand uh, what, what, what punishment is, no, or what responsibility is. So uh, what they did was sort of like make an evaluation on the so-called dangerousness of the person, and then uh, based on that, they can apply a security measure, which can be as long as um, 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 
well, the, 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 the longest penalty you know, that can be applied you know, for the crime that you've committed. So uh, what we uh, did was say, uh, to say to establish a provision, to enter a provision within the criminal justice uh, code, you no know, national criminal justice code, that established that, well, peop uh, the same procedure needed for everyone you know, was applicable also for people with disabilities. Uh, the concept procedural accommodation was also introduced in this uh, uh, criminal reform. And um, of course, this turned into a legal obligation to establish procedural accommodation. So uh, what we did was that um, we established this obligation to impl implement procedural accommodation and that is for all people with disabilities acting in different roles in the procedure, acting as victims, defendants, and witnesses. No? So that's, of course, something that needs to be further implemented in, in Mexico. Uh, some advancements have been made, but of course, new, new things have to be incorporated. Also, uh, as defendants, uh, as I was saying just before, mainstream criminal procedure it's now applicable for people with disabilities who, who are defendants. No? Uh, uh, well, this is already, I already said this. Uh, but the impact created is that, well, criminal procedure legislation depended on each state, uh, and because Mexico is a federation, so we are now able to uh, establish a mainstream uh, criminal procedure for, for everyone. But um, what are the specific outcomes that we have uh, achieved so far? Well, in Mexico City, this is information I have specifically from, from the capital city of Mexico, is that there is uh, a system, uh, an NGO that is uh, um, uh, following up on, on the legal representation of people who are accused of crimes, people that might have psychosocial disabilities, and they uh, push for them to uh, have uh, specific accommodations during the procedure. And it has been very interesting because, as you know, procedural accommodation as, as is tailored to the requirements that the people have. No? And so it's, a, it's done in a case-by-case -case, uh, measure. No? So um, this, this, this NGO, it's called Documenta, has been uh, uh, capable of uh, uh, representing you know, uh, a lot of people with psychosocial disabilities and, and, and having, having them have uh, uh, an assistant, you know, a personal assistant, uh, besides the, the, the lawyer to represent them during the trial. Uh, and of course, we have uh, very good rulings in a way, you know, that one of them in Mexico City a young man with a psychosocial disability who was accused of robbery was released because uh, during uh, his um, uh, initial hearing, no, um, the judge considered that he was not uh, um, given appropriate uh, procedural accommodation. So he was released on that basis. So what, what's good about this is that failure to apply procedural accommodation can be considered now a breach to the right of an effective criminal defense in Mexico, so that's something. But of course, there are still challenges of the reform, uh, specifically uh, how to train legal professionals no, uh, in, in the new standards of the um, criminal procedure. That's been a headache, of course, uh, on every element of the reform. But on this one also is, is, is challenging, no? There are miscomprehensions of what needs to be applied specifically, no? And also what's challenging is that although this is a procedure reform, uh, we still have the criminal substantive law that is not in conformity with the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities because it still considers that you need to apply security measures to persons with disabilities. And if you are going to be considered a full person with full uh, legal capacity, 
you also need to consider the possibility of having full responsibility you know, uh, on your acts. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Carlos. A very good presentation that you gave us there. Um, we need to apply case-by-case -case procedural accommodation for persons with disability. Very important. Um, before we started this session, my colleagues and I thought about doing a song, um, which we <laughs> called the Zero Conference Anthem, because we suspected that most of you would have checked out by now. But I think you're doing well, and you will have some challenging questions for us. We're really looking forward to that. So we'll open the floor for questions. Yay, there. Yes. Yeah, uh, my question is, uh, I have two rem one remark and one question. One remark is to, I, I like very much all the presentations, but I think uh, Carlos Rios has uh, raised a very important issue, and it is a very important debate, and it is, it, it's the debate of uh, criminal responsibility. I think that any provision that limits criminal responsibility of persons with disabilities is a violation of the CRPD. But I would like to know if that's also in the opinion of the table, especially of Carlos. No? And then my second question is about uh, in some, I think a, a very interesting uh, a very interesting proposal to uh, facilitate access to justice of persons with intellectual and development disabilities is uh, that the uh, court judgments be issued also in easy to read format. In Spain, there has been a pilot experience in this sense, but recently the Peruvian reform of the civil procedure code has, make compu has made compulsory that all uh, sentences, that all court judgments related to issues of legal capacity and supported decision making uh, be also uh, published in easy to read format. So I would like to know if there is some, uh, maybe this question is our wall for Ariel, because I would like to know if there is some experience in this sense also in your country. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you so much for your question. So the first part was raising this issue of criminal responsibility and, and you sort of opined that anything that reduces criminal responsibility of someone with a disability would inherently violate the CRPD. Um, I agree with you on that point. Um, it's interesting in the United States, the way our criminal law works is most crimes you have to have both a guilty act and a guilty mind. Um, but we run into issues with what we call statutory crimes where you don't actually have to have the intent to commit the crime at all. You can just do the act. And so we're running into a lot of issues, especially around sexual offenses and people with disabilities. And so we're trying to kind of navigate this dilemma of trying to help people get through a system that is not accessible to them but at the same time not diminish responsibility across the board because we know that can have consequences in other parts of, of civil society and other parts of the community. Your second question was about you know, kind of accommodations for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and specifically you offered the example of providing judgments in easy to read format. Uh, unfortunately, in the United States, we have seen fewer accommodations for those with intellectual and developmental disabilities than we have seen accommodations for other types of disabilities. Of course, in the United States, we have failed to ratify the CRPD, but we do have the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Rehabilitation Act, and several other disability rights laws that are operating but most of these laws do tend to prioritize physical and sensory disabilities. 
So when we do Pathways to Justice, what we're trying to do is get all criminal justice professionals to recognize in the first place that they have legal obligations toward the disability community and help them translate that into something that they can actually do differently. So we will give them suggestions even down to the level of how you introduce yourself to someone to make sure that they really understand who you are and what your role is. So we haven't seen yet these easy to read judgments, but we're trying to work with all the different types of justice professionals to create accommodations from, from start to finish. Yes, if I may compliment what, uh, on the question. Y yes, I think that um, a system that does not consider that people with disabilities are responsible for their acts is, is not in compliance with the uh, CRPD, specifically to Article 12 and Article 14 of the CRPD. And uh, the narrative that justifies uh, getting people with disabilities out of the criminal system is because of their so-called protection. No? So you say if, if a people with disabilities to, to, to follow a criminal procedure and a, and a, and a criminal punishment, or a criminal sanction, then that will leave, leave, leave the person under, uh, uh, un, uh, unprotected, no? But the issue is that criminal law was created to, to create protections, to create safeguards. And if you don't use criminal law for people with disabilities, then you have sort of like the uh, social uh, control, no? Imagine uh, the, the narrative, no? The, of dangerousness, no? What happens, uh, I had the opportunity to visit Spain, so you have also, also the, the, this idea of the security measures for, for people with disabilities, no? Based on, on dangerousness. And it's something that it's based on what the person is, no? And not on what the person has done, no? So you have to focus on that and build the safeguards not to overreact on, on what people with disabilities might or might not do. You have people with disabilities that might have robbed something and they spend uh, long periods of time under security measures because they are considered that they're, they're, they're dangerous and no, no one will take care of them. So criminal law is a safeguard. It's in itself a protection. Okay, thank you. Um, any more questions? Do we have to sing? <laughs> there. Hello, thank you for this amazing panel today. Um, I guess just generally I'm thinking, can all of you respond to um, what is the single most important issue you think around this issue you're facing in your country? And I know that's kind of broad, but um, it, it's just really interesting to see all the different countries here and what are the issues that you think, if there's one or two, that you'd really like to address right now and how, how you'd like to do it? So we can start with you, Ariel. I think that's a very interesting question. I think that I would have to say the largest issue in the criminal justice system in the United States is bias. Bias that's both implicit and explicit. So we know in the US, and I'm sure this is true in many places, that people with disabilities are marginalized. And as one of the marginalized community are more likely to be caught up in the criminal justice system. I think a lot of the bias comes from not really knowing the disability community, not being part of it, not understanding it. And so at least what we try to do through Pathways to Justice is build relationships between these two communities. Try to break down some of those stereotypes, some of those barriers, and just let criminal justice professionals really start to understand what is disability and, and what does it really mean and what it doesn't mean. Uh, and that really disability is just another aspect of diversity and identity, and it should be valued and appreciated as such. Uh, I think that, and I touched on it in the presentation, uh, there's a need for countries, justice systems, even uh, in very developed countries, uh, to look to technology for assistance. 
uh, I see in, in Scotland and indeed across the UK. Uh, there are certainly moves to have uh, more technology used within the court system, but still uh, it's taking a long time for the justice, the legal profession to really embrace technology. And I think that's something that really could benefit uh, persons with disabilities, uh, particularly those living in rural and ro remote communities. Uh, sometimes courts are a long way to go, and if things can be done by technology, that's often uh, easier for persons with disabilities, but equally it means that they don't have to travel. Uh, so I think, uh, I think all countries, all justice systems, all governments should be looking at their court systems uh, and seeing what more can be done to develop uh, IT in respect of uh, the justice system. I think for me, and speaking specifically about the, um, the experience of survivors of a brain injury, that it's discrimination in their daily lives, and the most important thing is to raise awareness so that people uh, understand that discrimination is unacceptable and that they treat people with proper respect. And the other, if I may, Chair, indulge, uh, concern that I've got is that uh, as um, funding has become very difficult for governments, the provision of legal aid uh, has come under real pressure uh, and we are able to provide this um, uh, resource 24-7, 365 days of the year because uh, legal aid is available and I fear that as that pressure increases, uh, that, that that really vital uh, support and assistance may disappear. Well, in the case of Mexico, I think the greatest challenge we're facing is uh, that the possible setbacks for the criminal reform, um, which uh, unfortunately uh, there are signs uh, that are not really good no, about, about, about this. Um, the reform established, for example, that in order to determine pretrial detention, you need to analyze the risk, the risk of the person being uh, processed uh, uh, on bond, no? Uh, but now there, there was a recent reform that was passed just last week, no, that established pre uh, automatic pretrial detention for certain crimes, which of course is against um, international human rights law. No? Uh, but for, for people with disabilities specifically, uh, also is to get in, in the mindset of uh, justice officials no? that you cannot be detained on the basis of disability. No? And for example, for resolutions like if you're going to be uh, on pretrial detention, cannot be based in any case no? um, on the, the possibility of having a disability. And although this is in the law, no? in, in the criminal procedure law, we still have a civil commitment law in which you certainly can be detained, no? Because of uh, danger on self and others. So there is an incompatibility there between, you cannot be detained criminally, but you can be detained administratively. So that's a, a nonsensical. But yeah, that is the challenge, the changes in cultural and attitude, in attitude uh, on the public officials that run the system. Okay, so we, we've got two minutes. Are there any last minute questions? Oh, it looks like we have to do the song. <laughs> but I, 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 I could add um, to, to the response on, on, on things that could be done in our countries, and I'll speak for Zimbabwe that I think that the single, single most important issue that we need to do in Zimbabwe is to review the policy and administrative framework. And by this I mean um, the framework should allow for better training of justice sector personnel so that their attitudes and their knowledge on the rights of persons with disabilities increase and also so that we chuck out of the justice system the charity model. Um, 
uh, you know, of responding to to um, criminal issues um, relating to persons with disability, but also so that we have inclusive budgeting approaches. And this will help to ensure that the needs of persons with disabilities that need to be taken care of by the state are not viewed as an add-on and a burden to society, but they are viewed as a need. So things like infrastructure changes that need to be made, um, the provision of legal aid for both persons who are um, accessing the justice system as victims, as um, witnesses, I think we share the same situation that courts are normally very far away and in addition to that, they normally have backlogs in cases so people have to come to the court over and over again and this increases the financial burden for persons accessing the justice system and this is happening to a population that is already very poor and also we need to ensure that social services are available so that the departments of social services provide the required services for persons with disabilities accessing the justice system and perhaps most uh, one of the other things in Zimbabwe is depoliticization of the institutions um, because most people end up um, experiencing arbitrary arrests and detention because of the political situation. And recently when we had some um, disturbances in our country, I remember reading a headline that a person um, with a mental health issue had been arbitrarily arrested. And this is very, you know, very sad because it happens um, when, when there are no systems to respond to their needs. Our time is up and I would like to thank you for coming into this session and being very active listeners and participants and for making sure that we don't do the song. Thank you very much and have a safe journey back home and I hope you have time to move around the city.